Oh my goodness. Hey everyone, how's it going? Uh, Pastor Pedro here with Pastor Greg. Pastor Greg, how's it going? It's going fantastic. I'm feeling a little stuck, but overall, doing well. <laughs> That's good. Um, well, I'm glad you're here. Uh, are you on any uh, special diet or anything? You look, uh, you look, you look kind of thin. I've been fasting. Ah, oh, fasting. That's excellent. I, I think maybe more of us should fast. I mean, you, you know, you look tall, but thin. It's not bad. Um, we are here introducing the uh, Christmas service. So Christmas service, that's today. Merry Christmas. Hope you guys are having a good time. Uh, Greg, did you do anything special for Christmas Day today? I didn't. Uh, I've had a hard time moving. I've been a little stiff. I kind of feel stuck. So I've just been smiling <clears throat> and just giving the thumbs up all day. Oh, I love the thumbs up. Good job. Thank you. Good job. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Um, I, I want to do a couple things, so let's do the announcement. Um, Pastor Jeremy said we have a look at the e-news. You know what? I reached my phone. Hold on. I look at the e-news because there's lots of important things. So, like, let's see if I can bring it up. So, uh, office hours. Oh, office hours. Greg, the office hours are December 28th and 29th uh, from 9 till noon. So, if you need to come in, drop off some socks for the sock drive, or you drop off your offerings because we're collecting offerings till the 31st, uh, you can hand them into the office on the 28th and 29th. Um, if you miss that, you can also e-transfer. You can also do the, uh, the church app, church center app, to do donations for, uh, for the end of the year. Um, what else is in the, Greg, anything else in the e-news we forgot? Let's see. What yeah, I, th I think so. I'm just looking here. New Year's Day oh, service, yes. right? Isn't that, that's normal. We're back in person. But what's going on with Kidsmen, Pedro? Right, so Kidsmen are taking two weeks off. So no service on Christmas Day or New Year's. We're going to join back in January 8th. We'll have Kids Ministry, Nursery, and uh, elementary. We did uh, an awesome Christmas, uh, Christmas, I don't know, kind of Christmas party. We had a party. We had popcorn. That's a party. It's popcorn, always a party. Drinks. We had like, uh, we had coloring, all that kind of stuff. We also wrote notes to the Grace Cafe. So I'm pretty proud of the kids. They wrote some nice notes to the Grace Cafe. Um, we sent those along with a first uh, pile of socks to the Grace Cafe to help them for the winter season. Um, I think that's it, right? Is that it? I think, is that it? I think that's it. That's all, that's all I got. Well, you know what? Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. Uh, what, oh, all right. See you later. Good morning, Faith, and Merry Christmas. I hope you're gathered around with family this morning and wherever you're watching, whether you're at home or you're at relatives' house or maybe if you're watching this several days later, whatever the case may be, Merry Christmas, and this is our Christmas morning service. I hope that you got uh, some of the presents you hoped for, kids especially. I hope that like some of the things you're hopefully most for on your list uh, came through. Uh, maybe you got some things you weren't you know, entirely excited about, but hopefully you got some of those things that you were just thrilled about. Uh, you know, I'm well into that stage of life now where we like, do we, like, I'm at, we just get the things, I, I just get the things I want. And so like, Angela asked me like, like what do you want for Christmas? I, I wanted like new boots and bindings for my snowboard. So I went and bought the boots and bindings that I wanted and they're sweet and I'm really excited about them and hopefully I'll be using them really soon. Um, but like, there's not really much surprise in my gifts anymore because like, we just get the thing that we asked for. Um, but then that, that, that balance on Christmas between like what we want and what we need, that's, that's the tricky part, right? I mean, like, we, like, we always kind of get those gifts that you need sometimes, like, you know, like the, the necessary things, and they're not as fun. But there's also then the things that we want. Maybe they aren't practical at all, but they're the gifts that we really, 
want. And as parents, man, we're trying to find that balance. You got to get the kids some of the things they need, and you got to get them some of the things they want to make them happy. And we're going to talk a little bit about that balance between what we want and what we need well, from Messiah this morning as well. And, you know, like, I can tell you for a fact, when we're talking about wants, uh, one of the best boys did not get one of the things he wanted off his list today. My older son, Elijah, uh, he made his list a few weeks back, you know, very diligently handed it to us, and it was a pretty typical Christmas list as it goes. A few of the items on there, maybe a little on the aspirational side, shall we say. He was shooting high on a couple of things, and that's fine. You shoot your shot, uh, take your chance. But there was one item uh, in particular that caught me, shall I say, off guard. Um, he asked for an antique World War I helmet right on his list. And I looked, <laughs> I looked at him, I looked at him, I'm like, for real? He's like, yeah. He's like, that'd be awesome. <laughs> so I gotta be honest with you, um, we didn't get him the helmet. Um, you know, I painstakingly sought for it in that I read the list, laughed about it, and resolved myself that there's no way I'm going to try and find him an antique World War I helmet. That's just crazy. But, you know, that was very firmly in the wand category. And no, we didn't manage to get that for him. Then there's stuff on the need side. And sometimes for Christmas you get things you need. One of the, the, the tension things in mine and Angela's marriage early on uh, was like our Christmas stockings. So like for me growing up, like our stockings were like, one, were like one of the key presents we got. And it would be jam full with like candy and like you usually get like a CD in there. And like, like you know, those like lifesaver book things with all the lifesavers in them. And all like, like, like the stocking was full of all kinds of good stuff. Angela's family growing up, the good presents were all under the tree. The stocking was like the practical stuff. And I, don't think, I think it's a, more of a Dutch thing. And Daniel's from a Dutch family. And it's so like the stockings were practical things. So maybe like socks and underwear, maybe some deodorant or like these things you need. And so like I remember our first like year married, right? And so Christmas morning and we were exchanging gifts together. We did stockings. And like my stocking for her was loaded with like all kinds of wants. My stocking was loaded with socks and underwear. We're like, uh, <laughs> we didn't communicate that very well. The difference between wants and needs. Now here's the thing when we talk about God is that God's not always going to be exactly what we want, but he will always be exactly what we need. And we're talking about Israel and like I mean, when Israel was waiting for their Messiah for hundreds and thousands of years, there were a whole lot of different opinions as to who the Messiah would be and what they might be like and what they would do and there, some of them were based really well in Scripture, and some maybe not so much. But they all had different opinions, partly because there's a really wide range of passages that talk about the Messiah. And different people emphasize different aspects of that based really on kind of what they wanted, you know, what they wanted the Messiah to be. I mean, we see it just as much now. Right? We haven't figured it out any better than, anybody else, than they did back then. And that, like, you can even look around like Christianity today, there's a whole lot of different opinions of what it might look like when Jesus returns. Right? And again, it comes from emphasizing different parts and maybe minimizing other things. And so when we look through the Old Testament passages that predicted the Messiah, as Israel was waiting, some people emphasized some parts, other people emphasized other parts. We're going to look at a few of those, and we're going to talk about the difference between what we want and what we need out of the Messiah. Three texts I want to look at. The first one is in Deuteronomy 18, verses 18 and 19. It says this, and it's talking about predicting the Messiah to be a prophet. It says this, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I'll put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. So there was a group of people that when they talked about the Messiah, they focused a lot on that. He's going to be a prophet. He's going to be a prophet like, like Elijah was, or he's going to be a prophet like Moses was. He's going to come. He's going to proclaim God's word to us and lead us back into following God's word. And that was the emphasis they put on the Messiah because that's what they felt that was most needed. And so they talked about that and they looked for that and they waited for that. There was a segment of the population that was really excited about the Messiah as prophet. There was another group that really emphasized the Messiah coming as king. And one of the, and there's many passages in the Old Testament that talk about the Messiah coming as a king. And one of them is in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. It says this, I saw in the night visions. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, 
one that shall not be destroyed. So this promise, this prophecy in the book of Daniel, clearly talking about the Messiah and pointing out, clearly saying, like, he is going to be a king. He's going to be one that's going to rule over the nations, that all the nations of the world will come and recognize his authority and his dominion, his power, and it will never end. And so some people emphasize these passages, and especially in Israel's day when we, got, um, when we get towards like Jesus' time, that like when they're under foreign rule, they're under Roman rule, they longed for this aspect of the Messiah. Someone to come and conquer, someone to come and bring Israel back to power in their region, to throw off the shackles of Rome and set them free again. Some of them longed for that as the Messiah, as king. The third aspect of it was, and there's lots of uh, prophecy around the Messiah being uh, the shepherd idea, the, the, kind of the, the caring, pastoral person who would come and just take care of us. One of the passages uh, that predicts that is in Ezekiel chapter 34, and it says this in verses 23 and 24. And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them, he shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord, I have spoken. Some people longed for that pastoral care, that the Messiah would come and just take care of his people and bring healing and bring security back to them. So there's some who longed for the Messiah as prophets, some who longed for the Messiah as king, and some who longed for him as shepherd, and some all for a mix of those things. And these are just a few of the many prophetic passages throughout the Old Testament that speak of the Messiah. There's dozens upon dozens of them. And many of them talk about different things. They emphasize different aspects of who he would be. Some talk about him being born as a baby. Some talk about him being a conquering king. Some mention and, and talk about him as being a suffering servant and having to die. Others talk about a righteous judge. So it's understandable that there was a fair bit of confusion about who and what the Messiah would be. Because the passages kind of seem to be all over the place. They, they covered so many different things. And over Israel's history, and as prophecy was revealed, beliefs and opinions about who the Messiah would be, they shifted and changed. And by the time we get to that first century AD, there was a wide variety of beliefs about the Messiah. And in Palestine, where Israel, uh, where Israel was and where uh, Jesus came, was a diverse place filled with Romans and Greeks and Jews and Persians and Arabs and many others. And so beliefs and ideas, it was a bit of a melting pot area. Many of the Jewish people, again, longed for that and expected a return to the gaze of King David. The days where David reigned over Israel and was their most powerful king, the days and times where Israel was at her strongest and most secure. Many along with that longed for Rome to be overthrown. They despised being ruled by the Romans being under their laws and felt oppressed under it and wanted to be free from their laws and their taxes. And the Jewish people had also by this point been without a prophetic voice for 400 years. So, so many of the people longed for God's word to be spoken again, for someone to come and lead them again and lead them back to God's word. And then we could talk about the Jewish leaders. And amongst the Jewish leaders, there were a whole range of different opinions as well. You remember in Jesus' day, there were two particular ruling classes amongst the Israelites. The ones were the Sadducees and the others the Pharisees. The Sadducees were kind of like the, yeah, what do you want to say? They were the aristocrats. They were the wealthy priests. They were the ones who ran the Sanhedrin for the most part. And frankly, the, the Sadducees were the ones who benefited mostly from the way things were. The Romans let the Sadducees direct the Sanhedrin and kind of govern Israelite law the way they wanted and let them have their power as long as they stayed out of their way. And the Sadducees didn't believe in an afterlife. They didn't believe in a resurrection. And so they didn't really focus or believe that much on the Messiah. In their mind, their opinion, they're like, we don't want a Messiah to come because Messiah, if a Messiah arrives... It's just going to upset the balance of power from which we're benefiting from right now. So we don't want that. So even amongst the Israelite leaders, there are some that didn't even acknowledge that a Messiah would come or even if that would be a good thing. And the Pharisees had a different idea of it. They longed, the Pharisees specifically, they wanted a military leader to come and overthrow the Romans, but to install the Pharisees then as the power. They expected that if a Messiah came, that he might be like the military leader, but when it came to spiritual things, he would be subject to the Pharisees' rules. So you see, they had a very specific idea of what they thought the Messiah would be based on what they wanted, not necessarily what the people and what they needed. It was kind of selfishly set up. Everybody wanted the Messiah to come to benefit them. They wanted the type of Messiah that would come and make things the way they wanted it to be. 
You know, God, come and change our nation and make it the way we think it needs to be. God, come and change our worship and let us worship the way we think we need to. God, come and change our leaders and make them the way we think them should, they should be. Strangely, not really anybody saying, God, come and change me. Everybody wants everything to change for their favor, but no one really wants to think that they themselves might be the ones that have to change. Or God may not always be exactly what we want him to be, but he will always be exactly what we need. And a lot of times that's going to be very uncomfortable for us. See, they didn't need for the government to be the way they wanted. They didn't need for the temple to go back to the way it was, the way they thought they needed to. They, didn't need to, they needed more than anything else to see the perfect love of God in action. They needed to see the grace and mercy of God personified. They needed to see Emmanuel. They needed to see God with us. And that's who Jesus was, Emmanuel, God with us. So that's what exactly what God did. God sent us this gift. He sent us exactly what we needed. He sent us his son, the only one capable of doing what needed to be done, of living a perfect life here on earth, of calling people to a new covenant and ultimately sacrificing himself to bring that new covenant into existence. So that through his death and through his resurrection, all the people of the world could be saved. So that every one of us could be reconciled to God and have our sin forgiven because of what the Son of God, Jesus Christ, did on our behalf. It's a miracle. It's exactly what we needed. But you might ask then, so if, if the Messiah came, and he came as, as we know, as we talk about at Christmas, that he came as a baby in a manger, and he came born in Bethlehem, and then eventually he would come and he would die and be sacrificed as his suffering servant. What do we do with those other passages? What do we talk about like when... Like, what about that thing about the conquering king? What about the, the, the thing about the prophet? What about the thing about you know, all the nations bowing before him? Is that just like not true? Do we just ignore those passages, pretend they're not there? No. They're still coming. See, while we celebrate Jesus' arrival, we celebrate his birth at Christmas, we look forward still today to his next coming. So what we can see plainly now from Scripture, what they could not possibly have seen then, is that the coming of the Messiah is actually a two-stage event. He has come, and yet he will come again. And when he comes back again, he's not coming as a baby in a manger. He's coming on the clouds as a conquering king. That day is coming. We see it in Scripture pointing up to it. Acts uh, chapter 1, verse 11 says this. And, uh, and he said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This is just after Jesus ascended back into heaven. This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go. He's coming back. Revelation 22, verse 20, in the, right at the very end of Scripture, says this, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We know, we believe, we trust, and we have faith that Jesus Christ is coming again. And that is exactly what we need. Because we know our world still struggles in sin. We know our world is still suffering and broken. And we know that Jesus Christ holds the ultimate solution, that that solution is in place and will ultimately come to fruition in his second coming. That death will be defeated, that evil will be no more, that Satan will be vanquished for all of times, and the work of the Messiah will be complete, and we will be united with God forever and eternity perfectly. Amen. We look forward to and long for that day. The gift of Christ's return will come, and God knows exactly when we need it to happen. I'll share a little story in closing. Um, for a while, when I was a kid, I had a waterbed. Uh, it was the 80s, and like waterbeds were a thing. And for those of you who may not know, if you're not quite of that vintage, there was a time in our world where people thought a good way to sleep was to fill a large plastic bag full of water and to lay on that thing. Um, I'm pretty sure 40 years later that the entire chiropractic industry is probably surviving off that fact because it was not a good idea for your back uh, so much. Um, but waterbeds, they were super fun. You could like, control the temperature of them so you could make them warmer or colder if you wanted to. And, like, and of course, it was like wavy, so you could kind of flop around there a little bit. And like, but here's the thing, like, as cool as having a waterbed was, like, all my friends were super jealous. So like, you have a waterbed? That's so awesome. And I'd be like, it's, it's, it's a bed. I sleep, like, I don't really think about it. And for the most part, I didn't, like, I never really enjoyed it. I just, like, I just went to bed. But every now and again, I'd be laying in bed and couldn't sleep. And just be sitting there, all of a sudden, be like, I have a waterbed. We like start like rolling and flopping around in there, like like oh, this is amazing. And then you fall asleep and forget about it. And I know it's a silly example. I know it's a silly comparison, 
But man, can we pause for a second to realize how little we appreciate what we have? How little we, ha- how we appreciate what we have in our Savior, Jesus Christ. I think sometimes it just glosses over in our mind. We forget how significant and how massive it is. We've heard the story a million times. We've read it a thousand times. We hear it every Christmas. If you're around the church, you know the story of Jesus. And I think we just, man, I think we just get kind of blah about it. And God gave us so perfectly what we needed that we just take it for granted. I think so. I I know I do. I mean, I, I can't speak for you, but I know for me that I just take it for granted. That God sent his son to earth. That he left heaven for our sake. That he stepped into our story to save us. It's massive. It changed everything in the world. It changed all of history forever. So as we conclude today, the last thing I want to do for us is just to read from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 20. And I want you just to stop and pause and put the phone down, put, set the presence down aside for a second, and just listen. It's a passage you've heard maybe hundreds of times. It's a story you know. But let's listen to it again together, maybe for the first time in a while, and really hear the significance of what God has done for us. Luke chapter 2. I'll start reading in verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinus was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region where there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the the saying that had been told to them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned to glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. May we always remember that God has given us exactly what we needed in our Messiah. Merry Christmas. Let me pray for you. God, we are so thankful for what you've given to us, so thankful that you know exactly what we need. And we pray that this Christmas, as we celebrate with friends and family over gifts and over meals and all these things, that we'll be forever, eternally, deeply thankful and grateful for your gift to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas, everyone. We'll see you back here in person on Sunday, January 1st. Oh my goodness, uh, I can't do this anymore. Come on, Greg, let's go. Beauty. <laughs>